Hello, and welcome to our session. Today, we're talking about administering tests and preventing cheating with WebAssign. My name is Shauna Campbell, and I'm the Associate Marketing Manager for WebAssign. Leading you through this session today is Andy Truce, who's worked with WebAssign for over seven years and is currently the Product Manager for Statistics, Teacher Math, Geometry, and Technical Math, based in our Raleigh office. We also have Michael Lafrenier, who's an associate professor of environmental engineering technology and mathematics at Ohio University, where he's been teaching since 1994. We're all very excited to have you all here today. Now I'm gonna to transition over to Andy to get to know you a little better. Thanks, Shauna, and hey everyone. I'm really excited to be here and talk about one of our favorite topics, of course, uh, cheating. So before we get started though and talk about strategies, first just like to get to know you a little bit better, like Shauna said. Uh, first, let's just like to know how long have you been using WebAssign, just to get a better sense of our audience here. Excellent. And uh, it looks like we have a good mix of people. For those of you new to WebAssign, it's fantastic. I think you're going to find that it's an amazing platform that enables student learning. For those of you who have been using WebAssign for a long time, uh, excited to talk about some new strategies and things that you may not have used in WebAssign before that may help you curb cheating a little bit for this upcoming semester. And now I have just another question we'd like to run through before we get started. And we'd just love to know, uh, how much have you actually used uh, WebAssign for testing or exams uh, in the past? Great. It looks like we have a nearly a 50-50 split. For those of you who haven't used it before, don't worry. It's not too scary. And we're going to talk about a lot of strategies on how you can make it succeed for you. And for those of you who have, glad that you're here. We'll talk about some new ideas. So first, uh, we'll talk about just how large a problem is cheating. I suspect if you're in this webinar, you suspect that it's, it's going to be a large problem for you for the upcoming semester or has been a challenge for you. Uh, there's been a couple of studies. This is some data that came from a, a research article from 2011 uh, APA that looked at high school seniors and how much they, in an anonymous survey, admitted to actually cheating. And then also just looked at um, another one that looked at undergraduates and how much they admitted to cheating. Obviously, you can see fairly significant numbers of students actually do admit to cheating, though, interestingly enough, 92% of students in this high school one were satisfied with their personal ethics and character. So why do students cheat? I don't think that a lot of the things that are on this slide are going to necessarily be a surprise to you, but it's useful to think about them individually because they may help you inspire new creative ways that you can curb cheating in your classroom. So first, uh, everyone else is doing it. You know, there was one, one instructor out of the Mary Washington University who did a research study and looked at this and found that direct knowledge of their peers cheating was actually the single greatest predictor that he found for cheating in the classroom. So certainly that's one thing to be aware of lack of intrinsic motivation to learn. Of course, as intrinsic motivation decreases, that means extrinsic motivation is gonna increase. And then students are gonna take whatever means is necessary to get that grade on that final exam and get that A. Perception of teacher apathy. Of course, if students are aware of the relevancy and why they're doing the work that they're doing, build that intrinsic motivation, gonna be less likely to cheat. Perceived lack of ability. For those of you who have a lot of students who may have had math backgrounds that they haven't had the best experience with math in the past, they're afraid of math. That sometimes is obviously gonna make them more likely to cheat because they feel like they need to do it and there is no other way to pass that course. And then finally, of course, not all students actually have a clear understanding of what cheating is. Certainly, I think most students would know, yes, you shouldn't directly copy off another student for a final exam. But other than that, there's a lot of gray area that sometimes can be confusing. So, in this session, we're going to talk about different strategies that you can use to prevent academic dishonesty in your classroom. And we'll think about this from the framework of first, what are some strategies that you can do in WebAssign to convince students to not want to have to cheat in the first place? But then once the assignment or assessment has actually begun, what are some things that you can do to limit students from working together, looking up answers, and we'll talk about secure environments. And then after the fact, if you are concerned about cheating and wanna, if you wanna check into individual students and assess, did that student actually cheat on the exam? We'll talk about tools that are available in WebAssign to help you with that. 
I will say that the focus of this session is going to be on tools specifically in WebAssign. We're not going to talk about third-party proctoring solutions, uh, but we are going to post a link in the chat that has a little bit more information about what's available with WebAssign for that. So first, uh, in terms of limiting student um, desire to actually cheat in the first place, here's some strategies that you can use in WebAssign. We have brand new math mindset modules that we've just launched. These math mindset modules, as you can see, they include uh, videos and reflective questions for students to talk about and learn about growth mindset, reframing failure, memory, and different other study strategies to get them to hopefully overcome some of their past failures and fear of math so they can gain that confidence that they have the ability to actually succeed in the course. These math mindset modules are in course packs that are going to come with all co-requisite solutions in WebAssign. And then if you would like to add them to a non-co-requisite book, they're going to be available in the free additional resources as well when you set up your course. And we're going to post more information about that in the chat. And also, as I go through all of these, I should mention that once we've gone through some of the options in WebAssign, Mike is going to do a fantastic run through of how to actually find all these tools in WebAssign and also talk about his extensive experience actually using these in the classroom. So what else can you do? Of course, frequent assessments. If students know where they stand in the course and they know that they're struggling on certain topics and they have that opportunity to study and get additional practice, there's going to be less of that need to actually, of course, uh, try to cheat when the final exam comes. So with my class insights, Students have a topic by topic report that shows them the questions and topics that they did less well on with previous quizzes or on the homework. By giving them more frequent assessments, they'll get more up to date data here. And then they'll have a nice blue practice button where they can go in, they can practice another version, and hopefully build up their skills so they can be more confident in their ability to actually succeed in the course. Um, as a side note, this same report is also available to you if you haven't seen it before as a faculty member. So you can see where your students are struggling. And if you are doing synchronous learning in the fall with your students, you can pull this up with them, show them exactly where, where everyone's struggling, and you can even use it to pull out some questions that you might want to review with the classroom. So our conditional release feature also plays well with this. So let's say that you'd like to give students a, a practice test uh, to give them a better understanding of where they are before they get into that exam. What you can do is you can use conditional release to require that students actually do that practice prior to getting into the exam. Of course, don't have to require it to get a 100, and that's, of course, up to you. Um, but by requiring that they do it, they might be more likely to get that practice, see where they're struggling, and then spend that time actually working on where their concept gaps are prior to getting the exam so that they'll be less likely to need to cheat in the, in the end of the day. And then here's one you may not know about. So you can also reference the honor code uh, within WebAssign with WebAssign questions. So Dan Ariely, a behavioral uh, psychologist out of Duke University that some of you may be aware of or know have seen his work, uh, he's done a, a lot of studies on cheating. Uh, one of the most interesting ones that he did was he had a fictitious student in one of the classes send out an email the day before a final exam, and he sent out the notes in the email that said, hey, everyone, um, I just found the answers to last year's final exam. Uh, click here to learn more. Sent out two different versions of this email. One version of it that did not mention any type of honor code or any type of academic dishonesty information. And then there was another version of the email that was nearly identical. But at the end of it, it said, by the way, I'm not sure if this is okay. You might want to check in with your you know, academic honesty offices uh, you know, at your university to ensure this is okay. And as you can see, there was a large difference in the number of students who clicked the email to look at the last year's final exam answers, just based on nothing more than was honor code information there. He replicated a, a similar type of study out of uh, with MIT and Yale students where they were given puzzles to complete. And basically, students had to self-report how many puzzles they completed. Um, the people who were not given any mention of a, an honor code prior to doing this uh, claimed to have completed 50% more puzzles than the people who had. So if you'd like to create this in WebAssign, we have a sample honor code question that you can use and you can duplicate. But of course, you can also author your own if you'd like to with your, with your own um, academic honesty uh, wording. How can you prevent cheating um, once the assignment is actually live? There's a ton of flexibility in WebAssign to help you. When you go into editing the settings for a different assignment, first you can randomize the order of the questions and how they're displayed. By displaying one question at a time rather than all questions at once, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for students to compare that their question three might be the same as someone else's question three 
And if you randomize the question order, that makes it even more difficult for a student to realize that their question three is very similar to another student's question five. They can still do it, but it's gonna require a lot of clicks and a lot of scrolling. Um, to further enhance the randomization that is available within web assigned questions, you can use question pools. So what question pools do are, let's say that you have, you're assessing, you know, in this case, uh, L'Hopital's rule, and you wanna give students three questions on it, but you don't wanna give everyone the same three questions. What you can do is you could create a pool of let's say five questions on L'Hopital's rule, and you could build a pool so that students will see a random three of those five, but it's gonna be completely randomized which of those three that the students will actually see. Uh, the numbers that you assign to the pools are completely random and are up to you, and you can assign as many pools as you'd like to with any individual assignment. Hey, Andy, can I interrupt you real quick? Yes. I have a question for you. Is there a way to put the honor code question at the beginning of an exam and still randomize the order of the rest of the exam? So that's a great question. There, there's not a way to do that within one assignment, but what you could do if, if, is uh, use the conditional release feature and build two separate assignments. So have the first assignment be the honor code question, and then there could be a, yes, I've, I've, I've read it, and then once they've done that, use conditional release to unlock the actual exam, um, and then they can get into that. So that, that might be one way you go about it. That's a great question. Thank you. All right. So randomizations, of course, uh, more than 90% of problems in WebAssign are randomized in terms of the values. If questions aren't randomized, uh, you almost entirely, it's because there's a pedagogical reason why we felt the question could not be randomized and that we would be changing the difficulty or the intent of the question. Um, but nevertheless, um, you can ensure that you're using different values for each student by selecting this option in the assignment settings. This is one of the defaults that's available. And near the bottom of the assignment settings, you have full control over what type of help content is shown to students and when and whether they can see it before the due date or after the due date. So one thing you might wanna keep in mind if you do have different sections that are meeting at different times, so let's say you're giving an exam to one section on a Monday and another exam or the same exam to your other Tuesday section, you might wanna actually uncheck all of these show after the due dates for the Monday section until after the Tuesday section is done. Um, but as you think about your different sections, these are some of the tools that are available for you and you have full flexibility over when people can see solutions, the answer key, uh, and other information that might help them uh, answer, the, answer the assignment. And then here's an obvious one that we've been surprised that actually a lot of, uh, we haven't actually seen a lot of people take advantage of, but when you create an assignment, you're gonna have a default setting that's gonna allow you to say how many attempts students get on a per question level. You can set that at an assignment level. You can also do it at a question level. Now, if you're giving a multiple choice question and you've by default allowed five choices or five attempts, um, I'm gonna say it's not 100% likely that students are gonna get the question right. You're probably gonna have some students who are somehow gonna still get it wrong, but you might wanna lower the submissions allowed for multiple choice or true false questions uh, to ensure that students can't just guess through all of the options. And that's available at a per question level. So how do you make it harder to look up answers if you're concerned about that? So we have a lot of we have restrictions abilities that are available in WebAssign. So in here, first, you can set timers for individual students or for the entire class. So you can set what you'd like that to be. And then if students do have time accommodations, there is the ability to change the amount of time that those students are enabled for the exam. Even to make it a little bit harder, if you go into the edit class settings, there's an advanced options place where you can do a couple of things. Uh, number one, you can take away the randomized uh, text to not show in red. So let's say that 3x is randomized in the question, it sometimes might be 4x, 5x, 6x. If the students can see, sometimes can just look at where the red is in the question, and it's gonna be a little bit easier for them to figure out what is the one thing that I have to change. If you turn off that red, you can, it's just making a little bit more work for them to figure out what was actually randomized in the question from student to student. And on the right side, you can see there's also an option to display the question name and you can turn that off. The advantage there is, you know, let's say you're using Stewart Calculus and there's a very common question. If you'd like students to not know exactly what question that is from Stewart Calculus, you can turn that off so the question name won't actually appear to the student and they'll only see the question themselves. To make this even more difficult and to ensure that students really are doing the work, they're not just copying answers, you can enable Show My Work. So Show My Work will allow students to use a math pad or also they can upload a photo to, talk, to write through how they actually solve the problem. And there's different ways that you can enable this. You can enable this at the assignment level. 
But what we might want to actually recommend, because it can be a lot of work to, of course, grade all of this for a long assessment, you can set this at a per question level. You can pick out a few questions that you want to make sure that the students actually know how to actually solve it and see their work. You can pick out which ones those are, assign some points for it, and then go back in and see if they knew how to solve it. And of course, if those are the only questions that got wrong in the exam, uh, or, that, or that might tell you something. And of course, if you'd like to create your own questions, it's going to make it, you can of course have full control to make it even more difficult to cheat. We have, there's a lot of flexibility in WebAssign to do this, to either create it from scratch, or sometimes what you can do, and we find a lot of instructors do, is you can take an existing question, you can duplicate it, and then you can change some of the words in it, you can delete a part, or you can tailor it just a little bit to better meet your instruction and maybe make it a little bit different from the textbook question. If you'd like to learn more about coding questions, you can see at the bottom there is information about a coding workshop that we do have coming up. Um, and if you can't make that, we do also have a lot of help available in our help documentation in WebAssign. And we'd love to work with you on that. And in terms of providing a secure environment, so Lockdown Browser is an option that is available in WebAssign. Uh, you can see here on the screen some of the things that Lockdown Browser limits. It, it essentially limits most everything. Students can do very little, if anything, but work on that assignment uh, while in Lockdown Browser. Of course, if a student has um, a phone next to them, it's, Lockdown Browser is not going to stop that. It's only going to stop them from what is actually on the screen. And then, of course, passwords are possible as well in WebAssign, and you can set this. One thing that you might want to do is if you have an exam that's password protected and you only want students to get in at a certain time, and you're concerned about them re-entering the exam or giving the password away, what you can do is you can set a password, maybe I love math at the beginning of the exam, and then five minutes later, change the password. So that way, the student can't just give it away to somebody else after the exam has started and try to enter that exam. So that's one strategy you might want to try there. And then in terms of checking for proof of academic dishonesty, there is some data and tools that's available in WebAssign to help with that. When you go into the score view in WebAssign, you can see for any individual student how long they've spent on the exam or any assignment, of course. Now, if you see a student who got 100% and they spent one minute, now, it is, of course, possible that they opened, the ex they opened the assignment, they printed it out, they left, and then they came back in and entered everything. Um, but it might be something, but that might be a clue that you might need to do more investigation, certainly. And then we do have timestamps that are also available in the score view that show for every individual question part that was submitted, um, when was it submitted, and also who downloaded the exam. And you can see highlighted here the IP address of who downloaded it. If you're in here and you see a couple of different IP addresses have been downloading the exam, that might tell you that more than one person is working on this, and that might give you a clue there. And to give you even more information, you can actually find out, to some extent, at least the locale of, who, of where have people been working on this. So if you find that you had a student who is in College Station, Texas, and then you find five minutes later that the exam was downloaded from New York, New York, um, that might be a clue that something is a little bit off. And what you can do is you can Google that IP address and um, it will show you exactly the location of where that IP address comes from. So hopefully those are some strategies that are really helpful. I'm now going to pass this to my colleague, Mike Lafreniere, who's going to show off how to find a lot of these in WebAssign and talk about his experience using these with WebAssign in the classroom. Why? Wow, thank you, Andy. And welcome, everyone. So nice to be with you here today. I'm going to switch over and uh, share my screen as soon as given permission. I've got a little sharing screen block at the moment, but um, I see quite a few chat answers coming into the, uh, um, there we go, into the uh, uh, question area. So I'll do my best to try to answer some of those. I've noticed the show my work and some other features with the honor code question. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll address them as best we can as, as time permits. So on the screen, what I wanted to do is really go back through Andy's presentation slides that you now have, uh, you will have in a recording that will follow this and demonstrate the components in WebAssign for what those slides represented. So I'm going all the way back to giving frequent assessments and assignments. And so what you'll see on this screen is a layout that I found 
to be advantageous for the student learning outcomes I'm trying to achieve with my students across a number of different content topical areas. So what we're seeing is more of a modular approach where frequent assignments and assessments are being collected prior to those high stake exams. And as I make my way through those list of assignments of variety types, it's here that I've taken advantage of what a lot of Andy has covered with regards to exams. Uh, I can use a piecewise approach and I'm starting to implement that with more success so that I'm not reliant on proctoring tools. Uh, students can take these asynchronously and I'm trying to deter the reliance on using Mathway or other types of online Wolfram Alpha, Photomath, the types of uh, tools that are out there using passwords, time natures, and conditional release features, which I'm going to go over where you can set these and then in essence it's up to us to decide how to roll them out to a degree to help deter that student likelihood of, of looking up answers to help respond to their uh, assessments. So I want to dig first the idea of, of conditional release and in order to do that I'm going to switch over to an item that is in your scheduler. So when you're in the scheduling component of WebAssign and that's uh, available in each and every course module. You get access to the various tools over to the far side of the screen that will allow you to take advantage of those conditional release, password, lockdown browser, as well as time uh, uh, restrictions that you may want to place. So each assignment comes with such an option if you were to choose that item, that question, or excuse me, that assignment, and that could be a lab assignment as well as these high stake tests and materials that uh, students are expected to to culminate in. You'll notice the tools available over to the far left in the item that Andy was alluding to with in the early set of slides known as conditional release. I use this with great effect in terms of driving students through the sequence of assignments I want them to do, some of which are instructional assignments. As Andy was alluding to how to get that honor code question uh, separate from the actual randomization of your test, uh, Didi had another great comment in there with regards to putting the honor questions separate from pooled questions and randomizing to some degree uh, what could happen there. So some really neat innovative ideas in the chat that are emerging as well. But you can tie in that percentage that you want them to select uh, or to complete. You might want them to complete an instructions assignment at 100%. And in those instructions are the honor code a question, question might be the password and other items items that you serve as requisites to entering the exam. Uh, and you have the ability to control and waive those. You can give a time test. Uh, you can limit the time to uh, any period of time, really. You can go as little as one minute. And I know that may sound a little contrary given the technical time limit bandwidth and things. So the smallest I've done is three minutes, believe it or not, in terms of chunking out and reducing students the ability to share content out and sort of craft the assessment over a period of time uh, as they hop from one assignment to the next, so to speak. Now you can type in passwords, as Andy alluded to, all within this requirement. If you do choose the lockdown browser, uh, that's something I've used in the past. I found it advantageous in the lab setting. I primarily like to use it there because it restricted those lab computers from being um, portals of other web access. But when using lockdown browser in the home setting, I've, I've, I've reluctantly gone down and, res and, re and resisted that approach because the students have phones and other technology they can turn on to. Um, so, but this does install on Windows and MacBooks. I've used that to the extent that I've been able to make it work. And it does turn off the printing feature, which I find advantageous. It's standalone software, so the students would have to install that on their machine. And so there's, there's the pros and cons of what uh, might be available to you there under those restrictions. In regards to the honor code question, Andy mentioned that he gave you an example of the QID. Some of you were asking about that. It's certainly available. Shauna added the uh, capability of what was mentioned in the chat to search for such items. It's a really worthwhile item to see firsthand. You have the ability to go in and search for these items by entering the code and the question uh, selection for question IDs, not assignments. If for some reason it comes back, because I noticed some things are book dependent, uh, it is possible uh, to um, uh, ask your IT folks and other uh, support people to give you the access that you might want. Uh, I've made my own question, actually. I, I borrowed it uh, with regards to what Andy did, and I am able to actually create my own version of it. So if you're pausing the video and want to see another QID reference independent of books, then that's another one you may want to take note of. All that said, uh, the idea of the honor code question has worked out to the the research that Andy alluded to, but also the uh, requirement that I can go back to students. And I have, unfortunately, seen students 
taking part in cheating and academic misconduct through what I tend to lean on are mostly Zoom online proctoring sessions. And our university also supports it with a testing center that provides Zoom and multiple breakout rooms as a means of trying to get students uh, an environment that is secure and, and likely to be monitored both their screen and the actions at the same time. Uh, so with that, I want to move a little bit further into the sequence, trying to keep track of all these things. Let me clear the screen. Uh, we want to talk about the assignment display. So inside of assignments, I've made a, a sample assignment here. I'm going to go ahead and hit save now to commit to it, called assignment display and pool question pools. So anytime you're seeing a demonstration like mine, you're able to go in and much like the honor code question, search for these AIDs, these assignment ID numbers that exist as you may pause the recording later in time. In this, I've chosen to take advantage of the ability to uh, make settings uh, changes. So let me go in that first. So in the ability to control this assignment for the purposes of an exam, you may want to, and I strongly suggest, choose to display your assignments one at a time. It's a favorite of mine long ago when my students in rural settings had very challenging bandwidth limitations that displaying one at a time actually helps with that but also works uh, positively with the exam environment of just seeing those questions one at a time, especially if you choose to randomize them. That's where you'll locate this piece of additional uh, items that can flummox students in terms of their uh, sitting side by side, should they ever dare to do that. Uh, the other thing that's worth noting is inside the questions Andy outlined is the pooling capability. So I've done that here in this assignment. This is something Didi mentioned where you could just as well place the honor code question right above this and then have a series of questions that would flow if you chose to combine those questions in a single assignment. Now, what you're seeing here is a really elaborate attempt to take 20 questions that I've chosen and only pick two, use two of them in the pooling feature. Well, Andy gave a slide to that, and that's available. That feature is available on the question browser uh, tool. So when you go into an assignment, I tend to put most of my questions inside the queue for the assignment, and it's possible to break these pools up. There are tools to combine and, and, and separate as you wish. There's icons there. I'll go ahead and do it in this case. This was what you would normally see with regards to a question a listing inside of WebAssign, just numerically one after the other. And students would encounter them either in sequence or random depending on your assignment settings. If you start to select either all of them with the nice selection at the top, or if you start to select them asynchronously or in some form, uh, you'll be able to pull them in a manner that lets you set up these pools for pick and choose. Uh, so we can actually pull three questions together, pick two. We can choose another set of questions manually. This is a little bit time consuming, so I'll stop after this. Uh, the idea of creating another pool. So we've got a total of two pools now, two questions out of three, one out of eight. And then you could leave the rest of the questions back to Didi's idea of putting questions in sequence. I can move this one to the top and I'm able to maybe make this my honor question near the top of the, of the assignment and then go into the actual questions themselves that are going to be randomly picked. This is in addition to the randomization that might be inherent with each question that comes from the publisher. So as I uh, attempt to update this, let me zoom out, you'll notice when we go back to the assignment, uh, the pooling is noted uh, accordingly, sorry. Uh, noted accordingly in the list of, of assignments. So we really only have one, two, three, four questions in this first set, even though there's a total of 11 that could come into play from this pick choose combination. So that's known as question pools. And I've used that to a degree uh, of, of, of disrupting the attempts by students to share or likely use one another's attempts at questions to then sort of blaze a trail for others to follow. Uh, and, and there are other ways I'll show, show in just a bit. Uh, so in terms of randomization, so we've got this pooling possibility. I'd like to build off that as, as Andy did in his slides. Uh, you have the ability to choose the randomization settings. So you can use all the same values. These are helpful maybe in homework settings where you want them to work and collaborate and, and see that consistency across each person's assignments. In a testing environment though, I find it much more positive and conducive to help disrupt students who might choose to share information by using different values. And I also do have my own questions in order to uh, further aggravate students from trying to rely on databases of questions from both the publisher or those that might be out there. The other thing I tend to do in terms of assignments when it comes to uh, exams is I choose to turn off these features. I do not like to leave these show after due date items 
And in many cases, I've been using the ability to, to disrupt and show it while they're taking the test. So students may not be shown at the time of testing whether they're right and wrong until all student data has come in. I can go in to the assignment and turn it on after the fact and let them use it as a review if I am not concerned about those questions ever being used again. Uh, so that's a possibility in terms of feedback. Uh, so you can make, mix and match these two columns of what you show them while they're taking the test and what you show them, if anything, after the test. Another point of contention here that's worth noting is class insights, an item that was shown in Andy's slides, is also tied to this. So if you want to keep an exam and its questions off of class insights, you definitely want to uncheck these features to keep that uh, level of access from students. Uh, another piece that I want to share uh, highlighted in terms of number of attempts, true, false, is down below again in the question portion of your screen. As I zoom out, uh, you have the ability under the uh, submissions and attempts capability. I found this out the hard way. Uh, when giving multiple choice questions, I found that I was giving students uh, a little more time, a little more than I wanted to. By default, I give students two attempts. I've gone down the path of exams with one attempt and typos and things were really uh, creating quite the dilemma for me to resolve and discern. So now I allow for two attempts and they have to adjust for typos and get their answer submitted correctly for symbolic and equations and other kinds of open auto graded questions correctly in two. But for true faults, I want to go in and change those or multiple choice so that they are just one attempt. I failed to do that in some of my earlier exams where students were doing quite well on true false questions through guessing in, in my opinion. So you have the ability under submission control to make a, a really good uh, tightened exam so students are taking advantage of open-ended questions um, with regards to um, guessing their way. Uh, you can also choose to hide uh, the information uh, if you want with students. So sometimes the information from this textbook is portrayed in your questions, the actual nomenclature of both author uh, textbook and edition and even the section and question ID uh, alluded to in the question. So you can hide this under the class settings. So where you find that information is if you were setting up your course shell, uh, you have the ability to turn that off and not let that show up for students to bear witness to the questions. When you click into edit class settings under advanced options, you have the ability to go in and choose to not display. This same course-wide setting is also available in the assignment setting. So if you like to have some of your homeworks allude to the textbook, uh, you wanna you know, maybe hide it, or maybe you do like this setting by default, but maybe you wanna go back to the assignment and you wanna adjust the way it's displayed, there is an ability uh, right here. You can see in my choice, I chose to hide that during the testing situations only. And so I don't want them to see those question references under the per assignment setting versus the global uh, setting that exists for the entire class. So those are some Mike, of the things as well. Mike, do you mind if I interrupt you real quick? Of course. Um, yes. So kind of going back to hiding the names from students. Also, when you're using question pools, do you let students know that they're going to have different questions? I do when I happen to go down that path. Uh, so they're alluded, yeah, it's, it's, it's clear in the instructions that what I, what I found is that I've talked to some colleagues who are having success with this, is if you give students a pool of questions that they're going to be experienced, it may be in the hundreds, um, and then they're able to see what's coming, and then I alter those just ever so slightly, because I always offer the disclaimer, questions will not appear exactly as I've given in practice or homeworks, they just won't, going to change the numbers at the very least, maybe a little bit of the context if it's part of the concept. And and so then the, the pooling is, is noted in the instructions so that they're not trying to uh, anticipate or game the system. Um, so yes. Thank you. Um, it's challenging uh, to pull questions that are of comparable type. And so what I'm doing mostly is I'm, I have gradually been taking the publisher's questions and making them my own thanks to the editing features, adjusting them slightly. And so the, the fidelity of question to question is quite near 99 plus percent. Um, you know, obviously, I can't declare it as 100 because there are changes. Um, so um, as we go through this, uh, another item uh, I'm looking through the slides. I'm just trying to stay on my, uh, I'll go off on a tangent in a heartbeat, as many might know me. Uh, so 
Time restrictions, uh, we've covered that. Hide name questions, we've covered that. So enable show my work is where I slipped a little bit. Um, so show my work's a fascinating uh, feature that uh, students can uh, take advantage and get points. I saw this in the chat as I was watching before taking over uh, the presentation. And so I'd like to point this out uh, in terms of show my work. I'm trying to find it here. In the show my work capabilities, probably passing it, there it is. Um, you have the ability, this is what the, it would look like to the student. When you open an assignment that has at least one question is all it takes to trigger show my work uh, grading capabilities, the student could end up getting points for whatever they type in, as was alluded in the text, uh, the chat box. Uh, so as the students just type whatever in and click submit, the default of WebAssign is to assign points for that activity. And so um, the idea is, uh, um, let me do this. I should have had this ready. Um, and so you have the ability to turn that feature off. So as students go in, they can upload whatever activity they do, however, however slight or in, intensively uh, accurate, they'll get a point or whatever points are for show my work. Uh, I'd rather assign it myself. And so my students are notorious for saying, I can see the green check mark and show my work. Uh, it graded the part that was auto graded. Why am I not getting points? So I get that a fair amount, even though it says it in the instructions that I'm going to grade it. <laughs> and so what you're going to see here is inside of the settings of, of, um, of, a, of a show my work problem, as I lose my way here, um, let me get the class view. You have the ability to go in and edit that question or questions. Uh, you can do all of them at once or you can do them on a piece by piece basis. And so what we may notice here is in the grading of this um, item, uh, we have the ability to enter a, a grading a tag. And so uh, one of these is, I just had it the other day and so I've got to <laughs> find it. Um, Oh, goodness. Uh, I'll have to show it to you the other way. Uh, I'm going to have to show it in a real class. Uh, so let me go and do this. So I, I don't remember it very often, so you can show how little I use it. Because once I said it, I forget it. Um, what you do is you go into the question you want to uh, limit points. And um, figures, I'm a little, a little flustered right now because I chose um, to deviate from my plan. And so that leads to this response. Here we go. So when you go into a quiz, this is an actual exam uh, that I've used in the past, and you have the ability to edit it on a per question basis. And this is so detailed that I wanted to take that extra time to locate it for you. So to the point of what was raised in chat, if you're wanting to not give points automatically, regrettably, you have to go in and set their allocation of points to zero points. Uh, and there's, there's actually quite a few elaborate ways to give conditional points uh, based on number of tries. And in the end, uh, this is more advanced assignment settings, advanced question settings, but you can nullify that point allocation that's automatic in Show My Work and go in later and give points to students on a per question, per student basis. So this is the phrase that is, you can actually type this in the help file. Um, type in, I was trying to do EQN zero. Uh, when I type this in the help file, it actually is a documented uh, step along with some other interesting uh, arrangements of customizing your uh, web assign tool uh, so that you can get it the most out of it. Um, so uh, that's what I wanted to share with you as a means of uh, giving some points. Uh, here it is. And so this is a documented item inside of WebAssign that it talks about advanced conditional points, no points for manually scored questions graded. So you notice I did a little cheat there and typed it in the help file as like you were supposed to know that ahead of time. <laughs> so uh, th this is really impressive if you do find it. And then once you set it, I, as you noticed, as I demonstrated, you, I tend to forget it. So you can do this on a per question basis. So if you're new to WebAssign to some degree, these question items columns may not be apparent. You can show them under show per question settings. You can turn those on, bonus and penalty, and you can go in and control. So auto grading for many of these questions, but uh, I do not give points for the show my work questions that are at the bottom here. You can even see the icons for show my work. And that allows me to go in and grade these manually and give feedback and points, both plus, minus, and negative or neutral. 
Uh, so that gives you a glimpse of some of the things that Andy had covered in his presentations. It brings me to a concluding point uh, of items. I have more to show, but I'm going to pause and try to answer questions as best I can. Am I okay, Shauna, time-wise? I think we're good so far. I've been answering a lot in Q&A and chat. Very good. Okay. Um, what I do have to share with you that's not quite on the script, I'm hoping it's okay, uh, and that I, I'm working on, and thanks to colleagues like yourselves, in terms of exams, the flow of exams has been uh, of concern to me as of late and how we go about uh, giving that access to students. I've got to find my assignments here, um, find the right ones. I've got two different accounts open. Here we go. And so what I've done uh, to give you a demonstration on flow, uh, there's different kinds of questions I've been uh, flummoxing my students over. Uh, I'm not using so many questions that are highlightable anymore and that they can highlight text. This has concerns with ADA requirements. I do accommodate my students in other ways, but for the vast majority of students, I do offer exams where their images, pictures is what I've been gradually uh, testing out to try to keep the students from copy pasting into the various online resources. And so what you're seeing here, uh, to the point raised earlier by others, I do precede my exams with an instructions assignment. I'll open this up so you can grab the AID if you want to look closer at it. It's not too uh, elaborate. It's just two questions. Um, and you can see the AID is near the top. And in the video recording, I think you'll, for those of you quick with the screenshots, you can screenshot, hit print screen, grab it. You see I put a lot in the front end of my instructions, but then I give them an announcement and they're expected to check and this really does fr uh, frustrate students because they have to read and they have to pay attention to details. Sometimes I make them check them all and sometimes I do hit and miss. Uh, but you can see here I give them the password, I give them indications of time constraints, I give them my cell phone number that really is just a, a computer number that they can call and usually it's helpful with proctoring situations last minute. And then I use something similar to what Andy alluded to with the honor code question where I also expect them to complete this with integrity in line with academic conduct. So these are items, they have QIDs, you can check those out and play them back. But ultimately I started off with a conditional release assignment. So they would have to get 100% on the instructions in order to open up the assignment that had a password that they got from the instructions, a timer, and then conditional release is the other icon you're seeing there. This is for an asynchronous environment. So students are coming and going. It has its concerns, as you might suspect, with students going in first and sharing. And so there's where I poll and create mixtures of questions and try to uh, limit that sharing and because that seems to be the most prominent from my witnessing of student activity. And then the other option that you have is to put assignments. Let me show you this. In another way is through this future button here. I can put assignments in chunk-wise format, no technical term there, but they, I take a, question, a test of 30 questions and I'll break them down into one to two questions at a time. And what I'm doing is I'm taking advantage of the due dates. And so this is for a synchronous approach that I've had some success with. So they might be allowed to take this test as a class between 7 a.m. and uh, 7 p.m., sorry, uh, Eastern time, because I'm trying to accommodate time zones to 8 p.m., and I will gradually set this up, and I don't do this anymore. I set up once and forget it, so it folds into the next semester. And I'm using availability, and I'm locking it out, and it just gives them very short periods of time, so they're not likely to text, share, take pictures. Uh, and then there's randomization and pooling happening as well in this as well. This has all been set up so I can roll it out. Uh, I got this from a colleague as well. And so the idea here is if you look at the scheduling of this, I'll show it to you in the reschedule tools, uh, the students then can go through in a piecewise fashion through exam one. So the due date is 10.44 p.m., uh, 10.54, 10.59, and, and I might shut it off at a certain period. I'm not very accurate there. But that notice it opens up. As one opens, the other one opens next to it. I do have conditional release tied to this, so they have to get at least 1% on this exam to get to the next. Some students got zeros, so I ran into that mistake. So now you can put a um, a simple question there that says I'm in this test and get one point and nominally or 0.5 percent you know something small that doesn't really affect the overall grade so at least it triggers into the next step so these are some of the things I'm learning but it really has helped me uh, further uh, reduce the need for proctoring and other tools um, as I best identify the concerns over cheating and so this this piecewise approach of just putting a few questions at a time really keeps the kids on their toes, but I don't like the anxiety and the math disposition that takes away their productive disposition. So there's certainly that drawback that I'm, I'm, I believe I'm keenly aware of. 
Uh, so when I go to create these, uh, I create an exam. I might create an exam with 30 questions. There's the instructions assignment. There's one that you can have the AID. But when I create an exam, I create an entire exam and then I just duplicate it and I start to delete the questions I don't want. And I pull them and then I just duplicate, duplicate, duplicate from the entirety and just peel it back. So I have a, a master exam that's out there for uh, me to resort to and then peel back the duplication and then I assign it over um, the schedule in chunks and manners that it will appear and disappear depending on my goals, whether asynchronous or synchronous, all of which you could overlap with proctoring tools, testing lab centers, or what we do at our university, we've been going mostly to Zoom Teams proctoring where students come into breakout rooms. And there's ways in Zoom I've been able to create where it makes myself look like I'm in four different rooms at once, breakout rooms. So I, I personally have tried it out to see how to proctor students. And all I do is just create dummy Zoom accounts so that I go in um, and look at each student. And I can just hop around through multiple web browsers and see them live. And I have caught students cheating uh, using Mathway and their phones and things. Because I'm, I'm usually, I'm, I'm, I'll give you an anecdotal, I'm usually looking and go, wow, that's a really good question. I'll hit the speaker and say, how did you really do that? That was impressive. And then they're like, uh-oh, I'm caught. <laughs> so that was disappointing, uh, anticlimactic. So hopefully, Shauna, that added a little more value to our time together. I'll pause. Yeah, I think that was very helpful. So I know we have a few remaining questions in Q&A. Um, do keep in mind that Andy as well as Mike will be on our um, coffee break in a few minutes. So feel free to jump on there if you have any additional questions. To close up the session, we have one final poll for you. Share my screen. Great, so we just wanna gauge uh, how confident this session helped you feel for fall course prep. Go ahead and answer that. And we really appreciate you all joining today. We hope you have a great fall semester. And thank you, Andy and Mike, for being here.